there has been a lot of controversy surrounding that museum, questions about the quality of the collection, the motives of Billie Holiday, and even the concept of separating women artists. Judy, what do you think? Does the notion of a women's museum change the status of women artists or simply relegate them to an artistic ghetto? Well, I think the National Museum of Women and the Arts is going to be a very important and influential institution. Um, partly because it's a permanent institution. It's not like another show that's going to be up and then come down. It's going to be a constant reminder to museums that women artists exist and that they can't be ignored. On the other hand, it's unfortunate that Billie Holiday had to feel that she needed to separate herself and the museum from what she thought of as the radical women's movement in art. And it's a little ironic because it's the scholarship of those radical art historians that the reputation of the museum is going to rest on. Um, and I also think it's an opportunity that was lost. Take Judy Chicago, for instance. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if the National Museum of Women in the Arts uh, were to buy the dinner party, which is really a masterpiece and changed art so drastically. Uh, and of course, it's been languishing in a warehouse ever since its creation and exhibition about 10 years ago. When State of the Arts continues, we're going to meet Judy Chicago. Stay with us. Judy Chicago has certainly done her part to shock and often anger the art establishment. State of the Arts met her several years ago at a retrospective of her work. See, the flower is about, the, I guess, the flower of femininity and the way in which the petals part and one sees into a, an unknown space. I knew I was gonna go past the confines of where I had been and where it had been permissible to be as a woman. Judy Chicago has spent half her life crashing through confines, both as an artist and as a feminist. She shocked the art world a few years back with The Dinner Party, a huge installation that has very personal female images. Now she's working on a series about childbirth. It's a subject that has never been done in the history of art, she says, because art has always been dominated by men. I mean, I, I was an artist in the 60s in Los Angeles where there were no women artists taken seriously, where there was a very highly macho ethic. Years later, a curator explained that he'd refused to look at her work back then because it was stronger than the work of the men around her, and it shocked him. And he told me this like I'm supposed to understand and say, oh, isn't that too bad? I mean, it devastated me. It was obvious to her that being the token female in an all-male art world just wouldn't work. Gradually, the female images she'd been trying to repress started to break through. She began teaching feminist art classes. She organized feminist exhibitions. She was determined to work on such a grand scale that she couldn't be ignored. For one, she changed her name to celebrate her new freedom, and she took the name of her hometown, Chicago. When she chose to honor women whom history has forgotten, she made a monumental sculpture, the dinner party. It's always been women who cooked the meals and set the table, she says. But at this dinner party, women were the honored guests. Women such as Virginia Woolf, Emily Dickinson, Mary Wolzencroft, all had place settings at the huge triangular table. Crowds of people came to see the dinner party when it was shown in 1978, 79, and 80. But some prominent critics blasted it no institution has ever offered to display it permanently. It's been in storage now for several years. It's still very difficult for me to talk about it without getting emotional. I think I made a good work of art, not a perfect work of art, but a significant work of art. <coughs> and the critical response and the kind of things people said about me just <sighs> was beyond me. But you know, I also had to make a certain choice because like for an artist, I mean, one, one has to go on. I have more to say. I want to make more art. The art she's making now is called The Birth Project. There will be 80 different pieces of needlework in it, and unlike the dinner party, these elements can be shown separately or in groups. Not just in museums and galleries, but also in places like libraries, birthing centers, and hospitals. All of the designs have been drawn by Judy Chicago and stitched by hundreds of volunteers around the country. Sue Blumenstein and Karen Fogel from Teaneck, New Jersey, have finished their piece and sent it back. Stitchers in Vineland and Somerville are still at work. Birth Project volunteers feel a great camaraderie, but they agree that Chicago is not easy to work with. 
she's a little abrasive, she's a little difficult, and I think she's obsessed so that, I don't know if you ever get to know who Judy is, really, because she's so involved in, in the work itself. The stitchers have to send their work back to the artist for regular reviews. And so if I don't like it, we do what is called reverse stitching. That's a needle, that's a birth project term one of the needle workers came up with. It means rip it all out. Ultimately, it's my decision. It's my image and it's my decision. And the thing is, is that that is understood from the beginning. Yet her stitchers continue to give their time and often their money to be part of the art that Judy Chicago is making. I've tried to convey a lot of different aspects of the experience, celebratory, mythical, joyful. But I'll tell you something. The, it's so shrouded in mythology and so shrouded in, in, in untruth. And it was, it is extremely, it has been extremely painful. It was painful to me to witness a birth, painful to me to see what happens to women's bodies, painful to me to see how women are punished because we're the ones who give birth. She herself is divorced. She has no children and no regrets. I made decisions about what would be good for my life and what would be bad for my life. And from my point of view, having a child would have interfered with my goals in terms of being able to focus on making a contribution and being an artist and doing what I wanted in my life. Judy Chicago has made the art she's wanted to make, and she feels she's made some progress as well. You know, I've been somewhat humbled by my experience in the world. On the other hand, one of the things that is very important to me is that to say that, that one, in the 60s, I couldn't breathe. And I feel, for me personally, the fact that I can breathe is a huge achievement. And I hope I've made some breathing space for other people, too, in that process. Judy, as an artist, have you encountered the same problems as Judy Chicago? Well, it's really an extraordinary situation for women artists. As an art student myself, the highest accolade you could receive was to be told that you painted like a man. And do you know, we prized those comments, and in the process, I think, undermined our own self-confidence tremendously. Over 75% of the students in college-level art classes have been and continue to be women. But until about four or five years ago, all they saw as teachers in the classroom were men. And it's really hard to imagine yourself as an important artist if you never see women in positions of authority. Um, society permits us uh, as women to be performers, performers of men's work or commenters on men's work. We can be actresses or we can be singers or we can be museum curators or dealers, but society makes it really hard for us to be artists or writers or composers. Society still doesn't value women as creators.